Hi guys. Well, thank you very much for having me again. My name is Rob Balsiger. I'm a local neurologist here in town, uh, general neurologist, so I see a lot of everything under the neurology scope. Uh, I give a lot of talks on stroke and other things as well. Today, I'm here to talk to you all about epilepsy, okay? A little bit about myself for all of you. Uh, I'm the stroke director at Desert Springs Hospital, where I'm also the director of neurology. Um, I'm part of the core faculty for Valley Hospital. We have a residency program there where we teach residents and medical students. So I teach them on a weekly basis. I hold board review every Wednesday, actually, which they're missing today because I'm here with all of you. Um, I serve as adjunct faculty for uh, Turo University out in Henderson as well. Um, I'm also a stroke team member at Valley Hospital. Um, I meet with the Healthcare Partners Group, one of the insurance companies where we meet just to see what we can do to improve the quality of care in the community. And lastly, one interesting thing, I think uh, I meet with uh, the UFC fighters uh, whenever they have any issues, and I also clear them for their fights as well. So, a little side note there. Okay, again, what was your name again? Rob Balsiger. Balsiger? Balsiger. Oh. Yeah, I'll go back right here. It's on the top there. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, again, I usually talk on stroke and things of that nature, but today we're going to talk about epilepsy, and hopefully you can take away a few things from the talk uh, for your personal lives, okay? Epilepsy is a central nervous system disorder, meaning it affects the brain. The nerve cell activity uh, becomes disrupted, okay? This can cause seizures or periods of unusual behavior, sensations, and possibly loss of consciousness, okay? Typically, we all think of seizures as falling to the floor and convulsing, but that's far from the case. They can present in many different ways. Uh, some people may purely have a staring spell or become confused. Okay, we're going to talk more about these types as we move on. What is epilepsy? Okay, I get asked that a lot. The, the standard definition of epilepsy is two or more unprovoked seizures. Okay. So what can provoke a seizure? What can cause a seizure? Well, there's many things. We're going to talk about all of that as well. Uh, some of the list, which is not all encompassing, includes alcohol, drug withdrawal, and I wrote benzodiazepines there in parentheses. That's a family of medication that includes Xanax, clonazepam or clonopin, Valium, or diazepam. It's typically, if patients come off of those medications abruptly, they can be at increased risk of seizures. Okay. That doesn't mean we don't use those medications. We certainly do for many patients, but you would want to avoid abruptly stopping them. Okay? There's a long list of medications that can cause seizures as well, which we'll see on a later slide. Um, anything in the brain itself can disrupt the electrical activity. Here I've listed a few. We have tumors in the brain, uh, a stroke, or even head trauma can cause seizures in some people. Okay. This is a, is a brief list, I just wanted you to know there are many, many medications that could decrease the seizure threshold or place a patient at increased risk of seizures if they're predisposed. Uh, some of the medications here include some of the common antibiotics like penicillin, uh, metronidazole is also known as flagyl, uh, isoniazid is one of the tuberculosis medications. Some of our antidepressants, some of our psychiatric medications, and at the bottom here, the one I really want to point out to all of you, uh, actually the bottom right is tramadol. So I, I serve in the ER here at Desert Springs Hospital. I can almost guarantee you I see one to two patients per month who had seizures secondary to tramadol. That doesn't mean it's a bad medication, but if, if you've ever had a seizure, it may not be the best medication for you, and I would consider not taking that medication. Oh, another one here. Um, psychostimulants. I wrote amphetamines down. Certainly we use that medication in our uh, children with ADHD. Some adults may use it as a stimulant to keep them awake during the day, uh, but that also can place you at increased risk for seizures. Okay? Along with our street drugs, you know, methamphetamine and cocaine in that category as well. A okay. little background on epilepsy. One in 26 people will develop epilepsy at some time in their life. To me, that's a pretty big number. Okay? The prevalence in the United States is greater than 2 million people. And it affects more than 65 million people worldwide. Okay. 
It's the fourth most common neurological condition. So who gets epilepsy? Um, most commonly, the new cases are in kids, especially during the first decade. And then we kind of level off after age 10. But once we're 55 and older, a lot of the population that comes here, the LaRuvo Center, uh, they're at increased risk, okay? People who've had strokes, people with brain tumors, even late in Alzheimer's, we've seen an increased risk or increased incidence of seizures. I mentioned that on one of the first slides, there's many different types of seizures, okay? It's not just convulsing, you know, falling down on the floor. People can have atonic seizures, which are simply drop attacks. That's where they lose postural tone in their body and they fall to the floor. You can have a clonic seizure. This is rapidly uh, alternating contraction and relaxation of a muscle. That's what we typically think of the shaking, okay? They can have only a tonic seizure where they just stiffen up, okay? Or a mixture of the both, tonic-clonic seizures. That's what we typically think of when we think of seizures. But again, there's many more. We have simple partial seizures. Those could be motor seizures, where just one part of the body is jerking repetitively. Okay. They could have sensory seizures, where they feel some funny sensation in one part of their body. Autonomic seizures or psychic seizures. Um, some patients, um, now people always look surprised when they hear this, they, they can present with just psychiatric manifestations. So they could look as though you know, they're in a psychosis, but it could be their brain is misfiring in seizures, okay? It's not extremely common, but we do see it, okay? We have others. So they look normal, but they... They may be confused, or they may be hallucinating, visually, auditory hallucinations, uh, et cetera, yeah. Um, complex partial seizures. This is a common one I see in the elderly community. This is essentially confusional episodes uh, that are seizures. Patients may stare off blankly into space or be simply confused, okay? Uh, febrile seizures, typically in young kids when they get a fever. Uh, some of your children may have had those. Gelastic seizures, this is an interesting one. I just threw it up there so you can see there's many different types. This is actually bouts of laughter uh, with seizures. It's seen in, it's not very common. I see it maybe once a year or even less. It's in a rare subset of tuberous sclerosis patients which is an, uh, uh, a genetic disorder. Okay, this is a big one. This is an important slide. Non-epileptic seizures. The old terminology for this was pseudo-seizures. We've kind of moved away, that, away from that, trying to be a little bit more politically correct. So non-epileptic seizures are not caused by electrical activity in the brain. Okay, it's not due to brain misfiring. They look like seizures on the outside. The patients may fall to the floor. They may convulse. They may go to the bathroom in their pants. But these are caused by subconscious thoughts, emotions, or stress. Okay. We most often see these in, in our younger patients, young adults and adolescents. They're more common in female patients. Okay. But one in six of these patients will also have epileptic seizures. So I think this is a really important slide, important thing to think about. You know, just because a patient has non-epileptic seizures or stress-induced seizures doesn't mean they don't have epilepsy as well because patients can definitely have both, okay? They may be associated with psychological conditions. And these are patients that would definitely benefit from long-term brainwave monitoring, which we'll talk about soon. You guys can ask me questions anytime, too. Yes? What role would marijuana tr would treat, help with the, uh, seizures, or is that what sounds great? So that's an excellent question, and I can tell you I get asked that very often, almost once a day. The question was, what role does marijuana play for, for epilepsy or non-epileptic seizures? You know, my answer for you is, you know, I have to take a approach where we follow what the literature says. What does the book say to do? There certainly is literature to show some benefit to some of that in, in young children who have you know, severe uh, epilepsy. Multiple seizures a day, may have some ge genetic syndromes. In the adult population, I don't know if there's much liter literature to back it. I, I certainly have patients who come in with anecdotal evidence, meaning it helps them, 
from, from my personal practice, I, I, don't, I don't write marijuana and I don't encourage people to go out and do it. Uh, but I can tell you, I, I have had patients who have, have said it's helped them. I know that's a little bit of a middle of the road approach, but um, there's not a lot of data in the adult population to, to back it at this time. And I guess I'm saying is does it inhibit the seizure? Does it make it worse or it does it no, no, no. I, I would say it's, it's unknown at this time. Yes? If you've had those um, been diagnosed with certain features at sure. the time, is there any likelihood that it can happen again or is it just a one time? Absolutely. It can definitely happen again and we do see that. Uh, there may be triggers for them to happen again. Life stressors, uh, becoming depressed, having underlying anxiety, somebody mentioned bipolar earlier, things of that nature, may put you at increased risk to have these. Okay. Uh, additional triggers for epilepsy, we mentioned some medications earlier. Sleep deprivation is a big one. We're going to talk more about this. Being sleep deprived or not getting enough sleep places you at increased risk of seizures if you've had them before. Um, alcohol use or abuse, certainly drug abuse, and I'm talking about street drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine, stimulants like that. Uh, stress, which we just mentioned medications. The two bottom ones are, are uh, important to note. Hyperventilation and then we all know about flashing lights. We hear that all the time, right? These things we'll actually do in our office when we perform an EEG on some of our patients if they can tolerate it. So we'll hook you up to the EEG, which is the, the brain wires. We'll talk more about that later. And we may have you hyperventilate for a minute or two and we may expose you to flashing lights to see if it disrupts the, the electrical activity in the brain. The, the biggest thing, this, if, you could, if you could take away one thing today, I think this, this is pretty important. The big, if you have epilepsy and you're on anti-epileptic medication or seizure medication, I wouldn't abruptly stop it without talking to your neurologist or your epileptologist, okay? The biggest risk to have more seizures is non-compliance or not taking the medication, okay? And again, I work in the emergency department every single day and I see breakthrough seizures multiple times a week, and the most common cause is patients missing doses of their medication. So you said epilepsy is diagnosed after two unprovoked two, two seizures? Are, two or more seizures. Okay. Um, some of the newer literature is moving towards, it could be one seizure if there's a high propensity to have more. Um, so if someone had a, a, a massive stroke, large structural damage to their brain and had one seizure, I would likely call that epilepsy because they're at risk for, for more. And I would treat that right off the bat. You would treat, okay. Yeah. And, and, and then would it be treated forever on then, or do you that That's a good question. We're gonna talk about that okay. too. That patient, if they had a large stroke, they may be on for life. Um, typically we want the patient to be seizure free for at least two years. Oh. And I would like them to have a normal EEG as well before coming off the medication. And then when they come off the medications, it's a weaning process. Yes, yes, very slow. And it's a case-by-case -case basis as well. Okay. Okay. And then Amanda whispered a, a question in my sure. ear. Is it hereditary? Is it there, there is some genetic propensity to some of the epilepsies. Um, but more often than not, I would say it's, it's uh, brought on by something else. Okay. So what can we do to improve our sleep? Because sleep is very important. If we don't get enough, we're sleep deprived, we could be at risk for more seizures. But exercising is very important. I think if any of you are patients here, you're gonna hear all of the doctors say that's important for your overall brain health. Okay. Uh, sleeping in a quiet and dark environment. Sleeping at the same time every night, not, not sporadic to bedtimes and waking times. Uh, sleep consistent to hours. Turning off our phones. We all have iPhones and all these electronic devices dinging all the time. Important to silence those. Avoiding caffeine later in the day, maybe five or six hours before bed, saying no more caffeine. Uh, some of my patients meditate and that really helps their sleep as well. All right, impact of epilepsy. Epilepsy can certainly affect our lives in many, many different ways. It can decrease the quality of our schoolwork or work. 
It can cause cognitive problems. Patients may have mood issues, depression, or anxiety. They may have issues with sleep. There may be unexplained injuries, falls, or other illnesses. And there is increased risk of death. And now I'm not putting that up to scare you. I'm putting that up just so you know that there could be some increased risk, especially if the seizures are uncontrolled. Okay. What injuries might patients with epilepsy suffer? Uh, certainly cuts, bruises, burns, any damage to the skin. If they have significant head trauma, they may be at increased risk of SDH stands for subdural hemorrhage. That's bleeding actually outside the brain but under the skull or bleeding in the brain itself. They may be at risk for broken bones, drowning, or even pneumonia if, if essentially a food were to go down the wrong, wrong pipe when they had the seizure. So when is, seizure, when is having a seizure an emergency? If a patient has back-to-back -back seizures or recurrent seizures, that would be considered an emergency and would likely warrant calling 911. Status epilepticus. This is a scary word some of you may have heard. This is now defined as a seizure greater than five minutes. Many, many decades ago, they used to say a seizure more than an hour, and then they moved it to 20 minutes. And now we say a seizure over five minutes is considered status epilepticus. This is a neurologic emergency and would warrant calling 911. And when I say the seizure, that means the convulsions. Um, I, I would not include the, the postictal confusional state that a patient may have. That's when they're actively having a seizure. We'd want to time it from onset. And if it goes five minutes or longer, definitely call 911. Yes, sir. Well, the person that's having is uh, convulsions. Yes. Muscle contractions. Mm -hmm. Are both the muscles that's used for a joint active at the same moment in time? Or? They could be, okay. Um, but if it was, if they were having the tonic clonic seizures, they, they may have the tonic phase where their flexors activate, like the biceps. Right. Or they may be having tonic seizures where, uh, excuse me, clonic seizures where the bicep is activating and then the tricep is going back and forth. Or it could be just a rhythmic contraction of one muscle going, relaxing, going, relaxing, going. What about your tongue? What's that? My brother had uh, seizures and I always had to worry about his tongue. His tongue, good. So we're gonna, we're gonna get to that too, okay? Well, I'll tell you, it used to be thought that a patient could swallow their tongue, right? And that's not the case. I, you know, I don't want to say with 100% accuracy, but I don't think anyone could actually s swallow their tongue, per se. Yes, they are at risk for uh, biting the tongue, biting the lips, and things like that. But we still don't want to put anything in the mouth. Yeah, I was told to roll them on the side. Correct. And we're going to see some slides on that. <laughs> I appreciate all the questions. I want this to be interactive, okay? I actually gave a talk to all the uh, stroke survivors at Desert Springs and I come with zero slides. I come in and we spend one hour and all we do is ask questions and go back and forth. Anything to do with neurology. And I think that's much more engaging than just throwing a bunch of slides up. But I do want this to be informative too and I'm hoping you guys can take something away today. Okay, the most important bullet here, most patients can live a healthy life. Okay, there is some increased risk of mortality. There is some increased risk of death in patients who have epilepsy. This isn't a pleasant topic to talk about, but you know the one thing to take away is SUDEP, or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Um, there is some increased risk of this sudden unexplained death that's not otherwise explained in patients with uncontrolled seizures. And this is not to scare any of you, I just want you to be aware of it and know the importance of controlling the, the seizures. Okay. Changes in mood. Patients with epilepsy can have depression. They can have dysthymia, which is a fancy way of saying mild depression, anxiety, or bipolar. There is an increased risk of suicide in epileptic patients. It's often secondary to mood disorders. Uh, some of the seizure medications could have some propensity to increase this risk as well if the patient has predisposing factors. So this is good. Some seizure medications can improve mood. I listed a couple of them here. Uh, Depakote or valproic acid. You may say Depakote ER on the bottle. Lamictal or Lamotrigine. That can be good for mood and seizures. Gabapentin, 
as well as carbamazepine. All of these could have a positive effect on controlling seizures and with mood. Are there bad side effects to any of them? Yeah. Certainly. All, all medications, all seizure medications, I mean, the, there is a list of side, possible side effects, but many of these are well tolerated. Okay. And we'll talk more about kind of choosing medications and what our thought process is as well. Yes? If somebody has the, the pseudo seizures. Yes. And they were on these medications and they're take, taken off. Mm -hmm. At any time, even if there's no seizure activity, would it benefit for them to be back on these meds or just? That's a very good question. The question is if a patient has only non-epileptic seizures, or only what we used to call pseudo-seizures, is there any benefit to placing them on these anti-epileptic medications? Not directly because we're not controlling brain activity with those or trying to decrease epileptic seizures, but some of them, like the, the top two there, Depakote, Lamictal, those can be given for mood too. Most specifically is bipolar disorder, uh, but they are mood stabilizers. So if there was underlying mood issues that were causing the non-epileptic seizures, these medications may be a benefit. Okay, and I, I certainly have patients on those that don't have epileptic seizures. Is ep epilepsy related to bipolar? Having epilepsy can have, place an increased risk of having underlying psychological disorders such as bipolar, anxiety, or depression. You would have, have an increased risk of having those Epilepsy. Because of the epilepsy or they lead to epilepsy? Because of the epilepsy itself or because of maybe some side effect from some of the medication. Or th there's many different things that could cause that. Okay. Okay. Yes? So can I follow on that? So having a stroke or a TIA, sure. could that later down the day um, have the risk of epilepsy? Yes, 100%. Not a TIA. So a TIA is a mini stroke, it usually, usually gets better within one hour, all symptoms resolve. There's no stroke seen on the MRI with a mini stroke. So there's no disruption in the brain, right? But with a stroke, that's, this is a loose term, but essentially it's gonna be a scar on the brain for the rest of your days, okay? And that could disrupt the electrical activity, okay? That's a good question, yes. Okay, so Keppra, I have a lot of patients on Keppra, it's a great drug, but we need to remember if patients are having any irritability, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, which is a big one, they would need to come off that medication. Okay. A couple of new ones here. I, I don't use a ton of these, to, but uh, Potiga and Ficampa, I don't know if anybody in the room is on either of those. Those have been shown to have psychotic behavior as a potential side effect. Okay, I'm not saying it would definitely cause that, but it's, it's a potential side effect. Thinking and memory. This can be affected by either the seizures or the medications themselves. Okay. Patients may complain of short-term memory impairment. They may have difficulty remembering names, numbers, dates, such as appointments. They may have decreased concentration or attention. And they may have cognitive dulling, which just means everything's kind of slowing down uh, and not at the capacity it was before. One thing to note about that cognitive dulling or slowing down, Topamax can do that if anybody's on Topamax. Uh, memory impairment. These patients may want to see a neuropsychologist. Dr. Wint is here, who's an excellent neuropsychologist. Psychiatrist, excuse me. What was his name? Dr. Wint. Wint? Yeah. W-I-N-T? Correct. <laughs> okay. He's very good, very knowledgeable. Um, so uh, Dr. Wint would evaluate general functioning, attention, language, overall mood, and perceptual skills. So we may need to treat underlying mood issues, adjust medications, or treat other medical problems uh, if patients are complaining of memory issues. Okay? A lot of epilepsy patients, as we all know, that's not the only problem. They may have had strokes, mini strokes. Uh, they may have heart, lung problems as well. Patients may complain of difficulty with attention. They may have difficulty storing new information or retrieving old information. 
And this slide, you don't need to memorize anything on here, but memory problems can arise from many different things, okay? It could be just the overall chemistry in the brain, it could be from medications, it could be from outside life stressors, uh, advancing age or poor sleep. This is what I see in my office um, with not just epilepsy patients, but epilepsy patients may complain of the things we've been talking about, short-term memory impairment. They may repeat the same question over and over. Oftentimes the spouse will come in and say, you know, my wife is asking me the same question every five minutes. Uh, they may miss appointments. They may have word finding difficulties, forget names of friends or numbers, and have difficulty comprehending what they've read. What can we do to improve our memory? Uh, creating lists, that's very common. A lot of my patients, not just epilepsy patients, will create lists to help them remember. They may repeat important information or important dates. Keeping things in the same place, um, the car keys, cell phone, wallet, always in the same place so you know where it is when you're looking for it. There are diff different things we could do to exercise our brain. Reading, very important. Uh, watching educational programs, taking a course. Okay, uh, new topic, diagnosing epilepsy. Generally, patients with their first seizure are gonna go to either the emergency room or go see their primary care provider. If you go to the ER, they're oftentimes gonna call myself or one of my colleagues, or your primary care doctor will refer you on an outpatient basis, okay? We may even need to send you to what's called an epileptologist. That's an epilepsy specialist. I, I know of one here in town, Dr. Bangalore, who practices out of Sunrise Hospital. Okay, this is not geared as much for uh, patients, but I just wanted to emphasize the most important thing you know, any, any doctor should do is obtain a detailed history. They're gonna ask you a lot of questions, and I, I think that's the most important start. It's likely more important than any testing or any physical exam as well. With a good detailed history, we should be able to come up with the diagnosis. And I, I tell all the residents and medical students that too. That's urine or What's that? Urine testing? Uh, history just means having a conversation, asking a lot of questions, oh. and, and finding out the facts of you know what happened. Oh, okay. What caused the seizure? So we want to determine were there any underlying factors or provoking factors that caused it? And we're gonna ask you a lot of questions about the event as well. Okay. What tests are needed to diagnose? Generally speaking, if you ever go to the emergency room with any seizure or any neurologic issue, the first test they're gonna do is a CAT scan of your brain, okay? That's not to look for stroke or tumor or those kinds of things, that's to make sure there's no scary bleeding in the brain. Okay, that's why you get a CAT scan when you go to the emergency room. After that, once we've ruled out bleeding in the brain, the next picture, which is the most important, is the MRI. That's gonna look for any little <coughs> scarring on the brain, any old strokes, any of the scary stuff that could cause seizures. And that includes tumor, uh, things of that nature. We're gonna get some blood work or labs. And then the next is an EEG, which we'll talk more about on Another slide, that's a brainwave test. LP, you're probably not gonna get an LP if you have a seizure, but that's a spinal tap or lumbar puncture. Some patients may need that if we're looking for infection or other causes. And you may need a sleep study as well. What should you bring with you when you go see your neurologist or any doctor for that matter? Of course, you want a, a detailed history about what happened, when did it happen, um, why do you think it happened? We want a medication list. Some people bring their bottles of pills in, but I want to know, you know not only what medication, but what dose, what's the milligram, and what's the frequency, or how often are you taking it, okay? Any other medical uh, issues you have, any surgeries, et cetera. Really important for seeing a neurologist, neurosurgeon, anyone of that matter, bring in old, pictures, any pictures of the brain or spine you've had, you wanna bring those in so we can look at them together and talk about them. Okay. And then a list of any questions you have too. I always tell patients, write the questions down before you come in, okay? And then we'll, I'll go over anything, any questions, anytime. So what's, what is an EEG? First of all, it's safe and painless, okay? 
essentially it's like an EKG we do on the chest, but on the brain. So it's some electrodes and some stickers. These electrodes don't transmit anything into the brain. They only collect data from outside of the brain. All they do is re record and read the electrical activity of the brain. Okay? It does not hurt, there's no radiation, and it's not painful. Essentially, we're looking for a seizure-like activity. If it is there, it can help us localize it to what part of the brain, is it the whole brain, and to look to see if any parts of the brain activity are slowing down at times, et cetera. Yes, dear? Can that test induce? That's a good question. Everything we've talked about thus far cannot induce a seizure, but sometimes we'll do these what are called provoking uh, factors or measures. That would be the bright lights or having you hyperventilate, breathe really deep and fast. Okay? And those could potentially bring on a seizure. And d different seizure types may be at more propensity to have seizures. Um, there are some kids who have what are called myoclonic epilepsy, um, generally younger teenage kids. The flashing lights can really bring on seizures in them. And then, I don't know if anybody's ever seen a young child with what's called an absent seizure. That's a staring spell where they'll just blank out for a few seconds and then come right back. Those patients, if they hyperventilate or breathe really deep and fast, that can cause a seizure in them too. Is the oxygen? Uh, you know, I don't know the exact, what we call pathophysiology of what brings it on, but it does disrupt the electrical activity, inducing the seizure. Your starting to do something, it's like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, it, it does induce a seizure in some. And this test is typically 20 minutes up to an hour in the office. Okay. Then the next question is, well, what if the patient truly has epilepsy, but we're not picking it up? We, we want to find out what's going on. Well, we're going to do what's called an ambulatory EEG. That's a 24 to 72 hour in-home EEG. That's where you come to the office, we put some wires on, and then you go home for a weekend with all these goofy wires on your head where we monitor your brain activity, okay? And it, that is much better at picking it up because it will look at your brain activity when you're awake and when you're asleep. With this test, it's pretty interesting. There's actually an event button or a button you or a loved one could push to if, if the patient goes into a seizure. That allows me, reading the test, to go back and look at that specific point in time and see you know, what was going on inside the brain. Okay, so it's pretty cool. There's one other option for testing for epilepsy in patients with a kind of an unclear diagnosis. This is called inpatient video EEG monitoring. That's a fancy way of saying you get admitted to the hospital for usually two or three days, maybe longer. We put you in a private room. There's a camera on you 24 seven, and you're hooked up to the wires. We have a computer right in the room where we, can, we record everything and we go back and review all of that as well. That's a little bit of a safer environment too. And we often use it in the patients like we were talking about before. Do they truly have epilepsy or is it some other non-epileptic event? Okay. Are they treated the same? So non-epileptic seizures are not typically treated with anti-epileptic or seizure medications. Okay. Good. Okay, this is important for any caretakers in the room. What should we do if we see a seizure? Well, we want to stay with that person until the seizure is over. Okay, we want to ensure their safety. We want to time the seizure. So we want to get our, well now, I guess it's not a watch, it's a cell phone to time it. Most seizures, very important. This is probably the second thing to take away. Most seizures should go away within one to two minutes. Okay, almost all seizures should resolve within two minutes. If a seizure lasts over five minutes, pick up the phone and call 911. We want to remove any dangerous or sharp objects around the patients. And again, we talked about sometimes we'll see jerking movements, right? Well, we don't want to hold them down forcefully, just allow the, it to take its own course. Okay, so don't try to stop these jerky movements on your own. They'll stop on their own. Don't put anything in the mouth. And again, you mentioned earlier, excellent, uh, turn the patient on their side. Okay. And then we all, if any of you have seen seizures in this room, you know that the patients will be what we call postictal, tired, loopy, groggy after the seizure. That would not be a time to you know, try to have them take water, take pills, wait until they're fully awake, until we give anything. Okay. 
maybe the third thing to take away from today, what, when should we call 911? Again, I really want to throw that five minutes out there. So longer than five minutes, 911, okay? If they're having back-to-back -back seizures, and especially if they're not coming back to their normal thinking and normal self in between, and they keep going into seizures, that would also be a time to call 911. Okay. If they're having any difficulty with breathing or if they've injured themselves, of course we'd want to call 911 too. Yes? A person can die if nobody is around? Not if there's nobody around. I mean, certainly a, a person could die from, from seizures, but that's typically what we see with people who have long seizures that are just, the brain's misfiring for a long, long time you know, somebody in the ICU or the intensive care unit in the hospital, okay? There is some increased risk, but, but definitely, you know, I, I don't want you to worry about that, okay? Okay, so don't leave the person alone until they're breathing normally. They can answer these four questions. Who, who are they, what, what's going on, when, and where, okay? They need to answer those, and then they should be back to the nor their normal self. Yes? I have a sister that is suffering from epilepsy. Sure. And also my dog. But I was out. Yes. And my dog, when I get back, passed away. So I don't know why. Ah. Why? I'm not sure. I'm sorry to hear that. Mm. He passed away. Yes, I went to the store. Yeah. And I take like a one hour out. Yeah. So when I get back. He was outside by that doggy door. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's anything you because did by not being there. there. No, oh. no, it's nothing you did by not being there. Because certainly we leave our epilepsy patients or pets unattended for, for much longer periods of time than that. So you didn't do anything wrong. Okay? Okay. So as a caretaker, what else, what else could I do or what, what could we do to help somebody who's had a seizure? We can talk calmly to them, reassure them they are safe. Uh, you know, I don't, again, I don't know how many of you have seen or experienced seizures, but losing the bowel or bladder is very common. They may need a change of clothes. Uh, and, and helping them to a safe place is very important. One other thing for caretakers here, if you, know, if you ever do call 911 and you're, you're not at home in an outside environment, you know, make sure all the belongings go with the patient to the emergency room or, or help them out by taking some of their valuables with you, okay? This is just a simple slide, simple picture I found on the internet. Uh, what can we do? Again, you mentioned placing the patient on their side. We wanna grab our phone or watch and time the seizure because it should go away within one to two minutes. Um, as the seizure ends, we can offer help or assistance don't hold the patient down forcefully. Let the seizure take its course. And we could cushion the head and remove the glasses as well. Okay. okay. Any patient in my office, they ask, well, how has my life changed? What, what can I do? What can I not do after having a seizure? For the most part, you can live a completely normal, healthy life. Okay. In Nevada, the, the state DMV says you cannot drive for 90 days after a seizure. And this varies state by state. Some are six months. Um, you know, here in Las Vegas, a lot of people have swimming pools and they go in hot tubs, pools, etc. Definitely that's okay if you have seizures or epilepsy, but not alone, not unattended. And on that note includes bathing in a hot bath by yourself. If you have seizures, then I would avoid doing that unattended hot baths. Showering, of course, is fine. The, we don't want you to have an event while you're in the tub or in the pool because then something catastrophic could happen. Avoiding heights, this would include ladders and things like that. Okay, so we asked, you know, what med what's the right medication? Well, th this, th there's no right medication that I can say just one medication is good for everybody. It's, it depends on what type of seizures they have. How old are they? Uh, are, are they a female of childbearing age? And you know, that comes into play in my office because a lot of the seizure pills are really bad for, for young females who are planning to have a baby. Not for themselves, but they're, it's teratogenic or can harm the baby. Okay. Should we treat that first seizure like we were talking about earlier? Well, it really depends. It's a case-by-case -case basis. We have to ask ourselves, was this truly a seizure? Was it a non-epileptic event? Um, what was the underlying cause? And then we need to assess with any 
diagnosis and any treatment, we have to look at the risk and benefit. What's the risk of taking a medication versus not taking it? Okay. This is not to memorize. This is just to show you there's a whole bunch of seizure medications out there, and it's really a case-by-case -case basis that we're going to you know, decide together what, what's the best pill to take. Question. Yes. So you had said that sometimes seizures are just like maybe a stare. Correct. Does that go unnoticed and then... It's possible. And, and those would be patients we would want to do long-term monitoring on to try to pick up one of those events. And, and, and would the patient know it happened? They may know if they, you know, they're, let's say they're watching a television show where, you know, they, they may say they lost time. Say, I don't know what happened for the last 20 minutes. Mm. Okay? So that, that may be something to watch for is lost time. And there again, if they go into a stare state and it's more than five minutes, that would be... That, that would also be a reason to call, mm -hmm. okay? But then it's important to decipher, is it truly a staring spell where they're non-responsive, or uh, are they just having, you know, some other confusional state, or are they post-ictal from a seizure, and just kind of drowsy, groggy, not waking up? So there's a lot of medications, okay, and you know, any of my patients, we talk about different options and try to find the best one. I wanted to throw this slide in, so choosing antiepileptic medications for the elderly. You know, things we need to think about. Sometimes in our older patients, you know, any medications can make you extra tired or sleepy or agitated. We need to watch for that. They can cause ataxia, which is a fancy way of saying clumsiness or putting you at increased risk for falling. They can cause your electrolytes to get out of line. Um, I wrote two there, carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine can cause, the, cause hyponatremia, which means low sodium. Valproic acid or Depakote can cause tremors in some people. One other one, I had another slide, but just to throw in there now. Dilantin is one of kind of the old tried and true medications. Very good medication, I have nothing against it. We use it a lot. But if you're going to be on a seizure pill for years and years and years, I mean decades, Dilantin may not be the best. And the reason is it can cause thinning of the bones or osteoporosis and place you at increased risk for fractures. Some, and some people it can cause the gums to grow. And this is not just using for a few weeks or a month, but long term, meaning years or decades. Dilantin, yeah, long term use can have some serious side effects. That's probably why you got all took off. I think they took them off that game. Gas Okay, that's a good one. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, my sister falls very often. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. And just for that epilepsy. It's possible. So we talked earlier. People can have what are called atonic seizures, where they just fall over and they lose tone in their body. She might be a good patient to do a longer-term monitor or test on too, to see if she's having any little seizures. But we're not seeing on the outside and she may re require adjustment of her doses, okay? Maybe she's on too much seizure medication. Maybe she's falling because she's toxic on one of them. I, I don't know, but we have to think about all of those things. Okay. And some of the seizure medications, you can check the level in the blood too, Dilantin being one. So you just mentioned gabapentin. That's the first one I wrote here. Uh, these are common choices for our elderly patients for, for seizure control. I wrote the drug names on here, but you know, we, we commonly use trade names. So gabapentin is also called Neurontin. Leucosamide is a newer one called Vimpat. Lamotrigine or Lamictal. And the last one is Levetiracetam or Keppra. Okay, so we were talking about Dilantin again. That can thin the bones, placing you at increased risk of fractures. Uh, this is stuff we don't need to go into too much detail, but a lot of these medications can interact with other medications, and it's important for not only your neurologist, but your primary care doctor and any other doctors to know, you know really what you're taking and, and can it interact, because you know, if you're on Dilantin, that may rev up the metabolism of another drug, making the levels of that drug lower in your blood. So you, you asked me earlier, when can a patient come off anti-epileptic medication? Well, it really is a case-by-case -case basis, and I'm going to look at every patient in detail before making that decision, but I'd want someone to be seizure-free for at least two years, 
and I want them to have a normal EEG or brainwave test before taking them off an anti-epileptic medication. Refractory epilepsy, this is a fancy way of saying, you know, seizures we just can't control. People who have seizure after seizure after seizure, no matter how much medications we throw at them, you know, what's going on? Well, I think it's important for, you know, caretakers, family, loved ones, the patient, and myself, or the neurologist to take a step back and say, you know, do we have the right diagnosis? Is this truly epilepsy? Are we treating them with the right medications? Uh, is anything else causing the seizure? Do they have lifestyle problems? Are they going out drinking every night? Things of that nature. Uh, and some patients just don't respond to medications no matter what the treatment. Okay, but what can look like a seizure on the outside but it's not truly a seizure in the brain? I listed a few here. Syncope is, is a fancy way of saying loss of consciousness. When people just pass out, may not be seizure or epileptic. A TIA or mini stroke we talked about could look like a seizure. Um, low blood sugar. Some patients can have migraines with confusion. That can look like a complex partial or confusional seizure. Uh, sleep problems, movement disorders, panic attacks could look like a seizure. And then again, non-epileptic seizures or stress seizures can look like seizures. I don't know if any of you have loved ones with epilepsy or seizures that is not controlled well. Anybody? So there are some options. There's two things I listed here, one of which is a really cool device. I'm a big fan of it. It's called VNS or vagus nerve stimulation. This is a device that goes in kind of in the same place as a pacemaker. It's a little pacemaker-like device in the left chest with some wires that go up to the, what's called the vagus nerve. It's V-A-G-U-S, not vagus like the city. <laughs> um, but goes in the neck, it wraps around this nerve, and it supplies a little impulse intermittently, depending on what the doctor decides the setting should be. And this is for patients who have really bad epilepsy, who often are not controlled on two or more medications. It's a really good device. I've managed a lot of patients with this, and um, big, it's, it's very good for the right patient. Yes, sir? Is it, is it automatic? It's, it's actually gonna defy, it's gonna fire continuously throughout the day. So let's say the setting, would, I would tell it to go off for two minutes and then on for 30 seconds. And it will continuously do that throughout the day. Okay. And then you know the next question is, well, what side effects could you have from that? The common ones are dry, scratchy throat because some of the nerves that go to our, the back of our, our throat come off that vagus nerve, one of which is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. People may have a dry cough, and they may have almost a, a hoarse, smokers-like voice at times, too. But it's a very good device. It really is. Uh, my sister is suffering since two years old. Yeah. And she uh, is suffering since two years old. Yeah. And around the 20s, she got schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. It's related to the... To the epilepsy? Uh-huh. Oh, it's, it's possible. There, they are two separate diseases. Uh, one is a psychiatric disease and one is you know, misfiring in the brain. There may be some overlap though with her. Actually, this VNS, I think I, the very last bullet, it's also good for mood. It's actually FDA approved uh, for uh, refractory depression. We don't put it in for that, but, but it, maybe that would be an option if she's having poorly controlled seizures. Yeah. I appreciate the questions. I, I prefer questions all day than, than going over slides. Uh, so just the last slide here in summary. Again, what is epilepsy? It's a central nervous system disorder where there's nerve cell, the nerves in the brain are acting too much and misfiring, the brain becomes disrupted, and seizure symptoms can vary widely. We talked about drop attacks, they can have tonic-clonic, which is a generalized seizure, they may have a staring spell, they may have just one part of the body moving, there's a whole bunch of types. What's the definition of epilepsy? It's two or more seizures. Uh, I think any of our family or loved ones that have epilepsy, we need to remember they can affect the mood, they can affect behavior, memory, cognition. Uh, we need to know when to call 911. Any seizure over five minutes, 
recurrent seizures if the patient gets injured, call 911. Seizure precautions, again in Nevada, no driving for 90 days. Avoiding heights, avoiding ladders, no swimming or bathing alone. And the treatment is really gonna vary from patient to patient. All right, that is it from my end. I threw a lot of information at you. Well, I just hope you can take away one or two things from today's talk. Do you have any questions about anything? Yes, sir. The sleep apnea, uh, would it tend to cause seizures? I don't, I don't want to say it would cause seizures, but again, poor sleep can really increase the risk of having more seizures if one oh. has underlying seizures. Does it affect the sleep apnea and not breathing for periods of time? Correct. And if your CO2 level goes down, then mm -hmm. enhances your chances of having a seizure? Or if your, your O2 level goes down, your CO2 goes up? Oh, that's what I meant. Yeah. CO2 goes up. Yes. Uh, Theoretically, yes, if you became acidotic enough from that, it could. Uh, but one thing, sleep apnea, for anybody who has that or loved ones who have it, that's a big one. That's something we can modify and control because sleep apnea can put you at risk for so much more, from heart problems, it can increase your risk of stroke. That's something we really want to nip in the butt right, right away. This, uh, when one holds their breath swimming, mm -hmm underwater for a long period of time, you get eye anxiety mm -hmm. or this feeling of eye anxiety. Sure. Is that like a precursor that might be happening when the person has a seizure? I think that's a difficult question. I don't know if I could say uh, the anxiety itself is that a prodromal. Well, it seems like your body's telling you the signal that, hey, go ahead. It's, you got to breathe. You got to breathe. You sure. Breathe. Sure. And if you're not, yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible. I don't know if those two relate completely. It's just interesting. Sure. Yes? Can you go back to the, to the different types? Of seizures? Of, uh, of, of the seizures, because I know that um, it was mentioned. So you'd be watching the TV, you know, and all of a sudden, it's like, you don't recall what you're, you're just there, but then until somebody either comes and say, "Me, hey, didn't you hear me?" Yeah. Is that either you know it's something else? It's possible. I mean, there's a lot of things that could put you in that state. I mean, certainly we see in our patients who have memory issues, they have decreased attention and decreased concentration. So those two things could be you know not seizure related as well. It could be from other underlying issues. But, but again, that person may be someone to get on long-term monitoring to see if they are going into seizure-like activity. Yes, sir. Again, and a TIA, yes. is that usually a, a clot, a small clot? Yeah, so a TIA, what's a TIA? It's, it's, a, it's a, not medical terminology, but it's a mini stroke. It's stroke-like symptoms or transient neurological deficit that lasts generally less than one hour with a negative MRI. So the MRI does not show a stroke. And yes, it could be some little thrombus or something that's been occluded that frees up. When it passes that area, can it, that one entity, mm -hmm. that, that piece, yeah. can it get trapped again? So it's certainly. Do have like a chain of events? Yes. Like TIAs? Yes, that would be called a crescendo decrescendo TIA, and that would require emergent medical attention. Absolutely. Okay. And where were you last year? <laughs> last year? I was at Desert Springs in the office still. <laughs> okay, so yeah, and again, if, if any, anybody has any stroke, family members who had stroke, Desert Springs or a lot, any of the Valley Health System hospitals have good you know, stroke survivor discussions and meetings. They meet generally once a month. They're, they're really good. Patients respond very well to them. So I, I would recommend that. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for having me.